So today the debate is about, in my view, uh, I would argue continuity. We want to see which religion, whether Islam or Christianity, actually has continuity with the religion that's laid down in the Law and the Prophets. And that image there, we're not going to go too deep into it right now, but we'll get into it here in a little bit. And I might uh, go back and forth between screen share and uh, some of the stuff I've got over here to show. The first question I would ask uh, in regard to this debate is, how would a 7th century Jew or Christian verify the Quranic claims? In the Quran, many places we're told that its hearers and readers should go to the Torah and to the Injil or the Gospel. This assumes a degree of continuity which could only be validated with the existing manuscripts and textual traditions that are already possessed by both Jews and Christians in the previous centuries. As laid down in a divine revelation in Deuteronomy 13 and 18, any subsequent prophetic revelation must meet the test of consistency with prior revelation. This here uh, would refer to the prior existing Torah, whether oral or written, including subsequent divine revelation found in the wisdom text, the historical books, liturgical texts, and the major and minor prophets. Islam and the Quran do not merely contradict prior revelation in a few minor areas, but rather gigantic portions of the Torah and the prophets are discarded due to obvious contradictions, inaccuracies, and inconsistencies with the Quranic account. Deuteronomy 13 and 18, for example, lay down the law that I mentioned earlier about how we test for subsequent prophetic claims. So thankfully, a Jew or a Christian in the seventh century who would hear the claims of the Quran has a, a convenient test, a way to go and see if the revelations given to Muhammad are consistent with prior revelations. So we know here in Deuteronomy 13 and 18 that they would have to be consistent with prior revelation. That test is also echoed, as you see there in Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this law, there is no light in them. The next uh, thing that has to be shown, which I may cause uh, some people some surprise, uh, is that the Old Testament prophets were Trinitarian. They were not Unitarian. Judaism, specifically in the Second Temple period, was not a monolithic Unitarian enterprise. The question becomes, what are the teachings of the prophets at, uh, in the Old Testament? Did they uh, actually teach, as Islam says, a radical Unitarianism? Or is it something more fluid, or is there differentiation in Yahweh? In fact, modern Jewish scholarship unanimously is, un, uh, is undecided on this question. There's a lot of Jewish scholarship that is uh, listed here. For example, Daniel Boyarin. Uh, later, I have Summer and I have uh, Siegel. And they admit that in the Old Testament itself, not due to Christian deviation, but in, in the Old Testament itself, we find many, many passages that show uh, differentiation in Yahweh. That differentiation is not just uh, located in rabbinic debates. It also continues into later medieval debates with Jewish Kabbalah. And you can see there, for example, Gershom Sholem in his uh, book on Kabbalah. He's the uh, respected Kabbalist uh, uh, theologian of the Middle Ages or uh, scholar of, of medieval Kabbalah. He points out, for example, the be three beginningless lights that are mentioned. Now, I'm not a Kabbalist. I'm just pointing out that this shows that the Jewish tradition is not monolithic in its presentation. So, uh, I'd like to come back then to uh, my screen, uh, to me here, and point out that the first display of Trinitarian theology in the Law and the Prophets is, for example, here on this whiteboard. And I'm showing this whiteboard because, hopefully you guys can see this, uh, this is a tremendous amount of text. And I'm just citing these because there's too many to fit on uh, a single screen there with uh, typing it all out. You can screenshot this later and go check the, ver the various textual references here for just examples of theophanies. And the reason I've included the theophanies is that these are particularly useful for demonstrating the manifestation of Yahweh in the Old Testament, proving differentiation. So not just Yahweh, but also the angel messenger that he sends, who has the name of Yahweh, as we read in Exodus, the same angel that's present in the burning bush. That angel is spoken of as the uh, messenger of the covenant. He's spoken of as in Judges turning the face of Yahweh towards Gideon in Judges 6, and many, many other passages where he's identified, for example, in Judges 13 as the uh, angel of wonderful counsel. <clears throat> so you can check those references later, or we can go back to any of those. And so let me go back to my screen share here and point out that the uh, 
triad there, I don't mean to argue either that the Old Testament explicitly uses the word the words triad. No, all that's necessary, as the Jewish scholars are admitting, is that the uh, the Old Testament believers spoke of Father, Angel, of the Lord, or Son of Man, and the Spirit in a real distinctive way, and they do. Although many in modern um, in modernity assume that the Law and the Prophets were strictly Unitarian. Jewish scholar Daniel Buaren notes that early Christianity actually represents a conservative form of Judaism that sought to remain faithful to the totality of Revelation and the Law and the Prophets, including the texts which portray uh, differing his, uh, hypostases in God. Another example of this is a uh, recent Jewish scholarship on divine fluidity and divine embodiment in the Law and the Prophets. Now, again, I'm not Jewish. I'm just pointing out that the admissions of Jewish scholarship are to our position nowadays. We are in, in the Jewish Gospels. The story of the Jewish Christ notes, for example, just from the example uh, from the, the text of Daniel 7, we have the discussion of the Messiah being divine, the Messiah being in human form, the Messiah appearing as younger than the Ancient of Days, uh, the divinity of Ancient of Days. We have the Messiah appearing uh, uh, eventually enthroned upon high and being given dominion and authority over earth. That is the, ascent, the, the ascension in, in Christian theology. Now, uh, early on in uh, the early days of Christianity, there were already rabbinical debates before Christianity and rabbinic Judaism uh, completely parted ways, where you even have people like famous rabbis like Rabbi Akiva, for example, admitting that there is multiplicity in some sense in the Godhead. This is covered in Alan Siegel's Two Powers in Heaven and in Schaefer's Two Gods in Heaven. Now, God is a generic term that can uh, pick out a specific hypostasis, and it can also pick out a generic nature. So when it says two gods or two powers, it's not indicating polytheism. It's merely indicating differentiation in the text. Now, again, I'm not arguing for Kabbalah. I'm just pointing out as an example that rabbinic Judaism is not a monolithic Unitarian philosophy. As Summer notes, this is a later Maimonidean feature and not a Kabbalistic or uh, early Christian Judaic feature. Second Temple Judaism and Christian uh, in Jewish scholarship was not monolithic. It was not radical Unitarian. It was fluid, and it did not admit God to be multiple due to later accretions. In fact, uh, Siegel and Summers and other admit that you can have a multiplicity of personae in early Jewish theology without that necessitating, for example, multiple wills. This is also seen in the process of the rabbis in their eventual exclusion of Logos theology, which is not a direct import from Hellenism per se, but rather from the wisdom text of the Old Testament, the Solomonic literature, and so forth. Jewish scholars like uh, Simeon Halevi, Sholem, Liaren, Siegel, and Summer admit that rabbinical dialogues and debates on the wisdom logos text and the Merkabah chariot mysticism that draws from both the Psalms, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Enochic literature all posit various divine embodiments, manifestations, and even incarnation. In fact, ancient rabbinical dialogues discuss the divine Messiah suffering, dying, and perhaps even atoning. One example is Rabbi Hagalili in Boyarin's Jewish Gospels discussing the atoning death. Uh, and then my friend, uh, the Jewish Messianic Christian, Ken Ami, has a book, Jewish, uh, The Jewish Messiah is a, is a Judaism versus Judaism debate. Again, just illustrating that Judaism is not a monolithic enterprise. Now, as uh, we get back to embodiment, Jewish scholar Benjamin Summer notes in his Law and the Prophets that they themselves, in many texts that I cited in my uh, big whiteboard there, display what he calls fluidity of Yahweh's ability to be both imminent and transcendent, as well as manifesting at certain times and in certain places in special modes and in special presences. This does not entail or necessitate a change in Yahweh's essence or nature, but rather that he's able to be embodied or to manifest in various and distinct ways. Summer even admits the dispute, again, was not over a strict numerical oneness, because many people in the ancient world did not always count by strict identity, but rather by division. Whether this distinction, the hypostasis, allowed for multiple wills is the real issue, according to Summer, and that, of course, is something that Trinitarians reject. We do not believe in multiple wills in the Godhead. Summer cites many of the holy places and iconography iconography replete throughout the Old Testament Law and Prophets, including altar stones, trees, which are dedicated to Yahweh. Uh, uh, they're made holy in anticipation of the temple and tabernacle liturgical services, which will also embody Yahweh above the ark, the Shekinah, and so forth, the cloud, while at the same time not embodying the divine essence or in any way altering Yahweh. 
that this, as a side note, the Quran also appears to have inadvertently left these references to this special presence in texts like uh, Surah 671 to 80, 1171 to 5128. Now, uh, the challenge then, as I would put it to Daniel, would be to leave him in a, uh, on the horns of a dilemma because Daniel can admit the law and the prophets are thus majorly corrupted or entirely corrupted. But if this is the case, he will have to give an account for why the, the Quran cites massive portions of the law and the prophets as reliable and the very thing that Christians and Jews can go to to verify the claims of the Quran. In fact, this is more challenging than it might first be apparent because we've already seen from uh, the test itself in terms of prior revelation that, that this places the burden of proof on the newer, later revelation and not vice versa. Second, Daniel must also give a non-circular epistemic criterion for how he knows which texts in the law and prophets are now, quote, corrupt and which ones are, quote, authentic. He cannot simply cite the Quran as his epistemic principle since the Quran is the very thing in question. Remember, the later revelation has a burden of proof for consistency, and hence why the 7th century Jew or Christian has no other possible means to verify the Quranic claims than to go to the older extant Jewish and Christian texts. As it turns out, this option is uh, arbitrary and a double standard on the part of Daniel picking and choosing hundreds of texts that he does like, while then simultaneously tossing out hundreds of other texts that he will see as corrupted. Without a clear epistemic principle to justify this ad hoc position, it is completely incoherent. Daniel should also show that the, at the time of the Quran's appearance, there was proof or evidence of mass textual corruption at that time, and not a later Islamic accretion argument based on the arbitrary uh, ad hoc use of liberal textual scholarship. Daniel, by the way, is arbitrary in the Hashmi debate when he says that he does not mind the uh, higher critical method being used against Judaism and Christianity because he argues that they evolved. Of course, I doubt that the, uh, Daniel would like that to be done to Islam and he would reject those out of hand. The other option on the horns of the dilemma for Daniel is to say that the law and the prophets are not essentially corrupted or made unreliable, but that they do not teach any form of real differentiation or Trinitarianism or distinction in Yahweh. In this case, you will have to explain the vast sampling of texts that I showed on the whiteboard, and there are more the examples than what I gave uh, the, than just theophanies. There are plenty of texts that even show, for example, three hypostases, Father, Angel, and Spirit as somehow consistent then with his radical Unitarian presupposition. That's what Islam is based on, a radical Unitarian presupposition. And this, of course, is part of the reason why they reject uh, the New Testament and its uh, argumentation for distinctions in God and Jesus being the Messiah. Somehow, uh, I think this is going to be, well, this is an impossible task, and this is why the Jewish scholars I mentioned back up what I'm arguing. Uh, Second Temple Judaism was just simply not a monolithic uh, entity. Next, I want to go to Quran uh, scholar Gabriel Said Reynolds, and in this text, we're going to see uh, several examples of where the Quran presupposes the biblical narratives, but offers no coherent account. In fact, it garbles and messes up a lot of the stories, and the narratives are not even consistent. For example, angels, angels are told to prostrate to Adam, but Adam is said to be still the image of Allah, and yet nothing is like Allah. This is uh, Quran 42.11, where it says nothing is like Allah. Satan's fall, the entire cosmology is assumed. You can look at Reynolds, page 54, uh, and there's a multiple text is why I put Reynolds 54. Abraham is a uh, rational, natural theologian, but also perhaps an idolater who changes position. And also Genesis 18 has a lot in their midst there, uh, Quran 11, 69, 72. Sarah laughs before the announcement, uh, which doesn't make any sense because that's the naming of her son on the basis of the laughing when she's told that she would have uh, a son in her old age. Nimrod and Hamad are confused with Pharaoh. There are Sabbath contradictions that the Sabbath is not from God. The Jonah story is incoherent. It's not explained why he leaves. Rather, uh, Jonah is mentioned, and this is a really important point, and yet crucial major and minor prophets are never given any place or listing in terms of their significance in the Quran. We have, for example, Korah's rebellion mentioned in the Quran, but nothing from Jeremiah, Isaiah, or the Psalms. And perhaps that's because Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the Psalms are tremendously important for the meaning and significance of Jesus's life and ministry, particularly Isaiah as what many have called the fifth gospel, because there's so many messianic prophecies there. But it makes sense that if you were a religion based on a hodgepodge, you would want to ignore or you just simply don't understand things like what's in Isaiah. There's other examples, too, that you can see there, the martyrs eating uh, and the uh, reliance of the Quran on things like the Proto-Evangelium of James, the Talmud. But I want to move on down to the key point here, which is that it's not just a question of the divine unity, but a question of 
the work of the Messiah, the heavenly temple, an everlasting priesthood, a sacrifice and worship, all of which are required, including the altar uh, in the Old Testament, which, as you can see, Islam has none of, and so it has no continuity with the Old Testament.